Welcome to the award-winning Dare to Dream podcast with Debbie Dashner, covering metaphysics, ETs, shamanism, and channeling. Here you will find spiritual inspiration from today's thought leaders, along with cutting-edge insights from our interstellar brothers and sisters and ancient shamanic wisdom. Now, here's a new episode of Dare to Dream with your host, Debbie Dashinger. Hi, this is Debbie Dashinger, and welcome to Dare to Dream. Such a pleasure to be with you. Have an amazing show for you today, beautiful people, because today I'm speaking with Don Oscar Miro Cuisada, who is the originator of the Pachacuti Mesa, transmitter of wisdom traditions, vision keeper of the Heart of the Healer Shamanic Mystery School. Dare to Dream podcast won three talk radio positive change awards, won the COV award for best radio podcast show, Welp magazine named Dare to Dream, one of the top 20 best podcasts to listen to this year, and it's high ranking under Apple Podcasts. The membership is open on YouTube. Please go there. And also right now, newly released on Gaia TV is my interview with George Norrie on his Beyond Belief TV show. You can go there and watch it now, all about shamanism and extraterrestrials, the very subject that Don Oscar and I are talking about. And in fact, there's a beautiful clip featuring our guest today on that particular show. If you do not have a subscription, there will be a link in the show notes so you can sign up for a two-week free trial. Thanks to Dr. Dane here in Access Consciousness for sponsoring this show. They do energy work out in the world, and you can find him at Dr. Dane here, H E E R dot com. I'm Debbie Dashinger. I am a book writing coach. I also take your book to a guaranteed international bestselling status. And I do some boutique work on the side for spiritual messengers. And specifically, I get them booked, scheduled on podcast interviews. I have a new free gift for you guys. I'm very proud of this. And I mean free and what a download this is. It is a two-hour deep dive on star seeds, 14 different star seeds. And Debbie Solaris and I break them down. And along with that, you will also get a 21-page report with 19 different star seeds and a lot of breakdown about your mission, your gifts, your weaknesses, your strengths. So get your free gift rather than reading the URL to you. Go ahead and also get your gift and the link in the show notes. My guest is Don Oscar Miro Cuisada, a revered Kamaska Curandero, an Alta Misayoc adept from Peru, founder of the Heart of the Healer, or Thoth, and the Pachacuti Mesa tradition of cross-cultural shamanism. He is an internationally acclaimed shamanic teacher, healer, ceremonialist, and author of many incredible books. As a faculty member at the Shift Network and other educational centers worldwide, Don Oscar dedicates his life to reviving Aboriginal wisdom to restore sacred trust between humankind and nature. A seasoned navigator of non-ordinary states of consciousness, he empowers people to access multidimensional healing for themselves and the planet. His work has been featured on Sounds True, CNN, and Univision, a and Discovery Channel, and the History Channel's Ancient Aliens. You can learn more about him at heartofthehealer.org and also find all his books on Amazon, amazon.com. And with that, I welcome the amazing Don Oscar back again for a second time to Dare to Dream. It is great to have you. Aim punchao warmicha. Thank you, thank you for having me on again, Debbie. This is going to be a fascinating sojourn through the hyperspace dimensions of our cosmic shamanic ET consciousness. Uh, having spent a little time with you for the first time, we met at Drala Mountain Center in Colorado and found a great compatibility, a deep sense of soul resonance mm. regarding our yearning to disclose as well as rediscover the ancient wisdom of our star relatives embodied, embedded, 
and given form in the sacred temple sites and ritual practices of our original peoples. So I'm thoroughly excited to explore this further with you. Thank Thanks you so much. Me. Yes, absolutely. And so for folks who are listening and watching, please know that our conversation today is going to be about shamanism specifically, and we've got a phenomenal expert here in that, and also bridging that into extraterrestrials and UFOs and where the common ground is, where they intersect, and why they might be important, both of them together at this very auspicious time. So, Don Oscar, you are an Alto Mesiok. And that is the highest lineage chosen by the Apus, by the sacred mountains, the spirits of the mountains who cause this kind of uh, shaman to often be struck by lightning. And then if the shaman survives, he or she becomes an Alto Mesayok. So is that how you came to be of the highest order of shamans? Was it about lightning or another way? Well, <laughs> It depends on how scholarly accurate you want to get. Um, Alto Misayok is really not the highest level of the Paco lineage. The Curaca Cuyek and the Inca Malcu is, which is the fourth and fifth level. Alto Misayok is the second level that comes after basically a propitiatory earth honoring expert. And uh, I received my uh, Mascaricay. Uh, initiation or level of uh, of acceptance as an alto misayo from my mentor don benito coriwaman barrios from the village of wasau outside of cusco in 1986 mm -hmm. and it was based on my ability to work with the consciousness of the mountain deities known as apus and using despachos or haiwas the offerings made of various ingredients that satiate the hunger of the mountain deities for the obeisance and the the devotion of our of their human children to maintaining the sanctity that is their birthright. So as an Alto Misayok, I do many, many things, but I don't necessarily receive that level of recognition because of having survived a lightning strike. Although I have, but not in the context of that type of shamanic initiation. My training in Paco Puna lineage shamanism took place primarily between 82 and 86 in, in a sporadic uh, initiatory relationship with this very famed healer, Don Benito Coriwaman Vargas where he taught me how to read coca leaves is a divination practice, where how to read the entrails of guinea pigs as a divination practice, of how to, which uh, libations to offer, is specifically how to prepare various forms of fermented corn beer known as aja and chicha to pour at particular times of the year upon the earth and on sacred rock outcroppings to engage and elicit the participation of what are known as the tiracuna, the watchers, the spirit helpers that embody those sacred sites, and various other types of propitiatory or intercessory types of prayerful ritual offerings. And that's different from the northern coastal, which is focused much more on healing on an individual or community level. The Paco or Paco Puna or Alto Misayok lineage is more dedicated to working with the powers, forces, energies, tonalities, and wisdom of the living earth and entering into a harmonious relationship with those and therefore bringing wholeness, balance, and healing to their community. While in the northern coastal regions and southern coastal region of Peru, which I had most of my apprenticeship, it's focused specifically on healing individuals, families, and the community through very elaborate rituals, some of them uh, including and involving the ingestion of visionary plant relatives or medicines, uh, primarily Tricuserios uh, Pachanoi or Peruvianis, which is the famed San Pedro cactus, mm -hmm. which I've had ample experience in doing that type of ceremonial practice. So. Wow. So I don't know if that is a response to your question, but as we move into this, I would like to just say a little prayer to harmonize where we're going, if that's I okay. Love that. Yes, that would be very special. 
And this and prayer you'll be speaking in Quechua in the yes. language. And I'll translate. And this prayer is derived from the Paco lineage. So I ask everybody who is participating with us today to open up their bodies and bring awareness to their breath, allowing their breath to be the gateway, the stargate, the portal through which we can release our consciousness beyond the physical encapsulation we experience as three-dimensional beings and dream freely a story of return to the starlight of our origins and receive this sacred runasimi invocation. Chaskamanta aipamang kutimuni Ankapi kunturpi fawani. Chaiwakunapi wampuni. Pachamamapi hampini. Nunapi kausani. Hinaya. And loosely translated this onomatopoeic oration is translated as, from star to earth I fall and return, in eagle and condor I fly, in whale and dolphin I swim, in Pachamama I heal, in soul I live. So mote it be. Mm. Take a deep breath, filling your lungs to capacity with this field of resonant shamanic awareness or gnosis of knowledge that you are much more than your physical embodied expression as a two-legged, that you are a multidimensional entity capable of fashioning this earth into the Edenic habitat known to our original peoples and realize we have the inner resourcefulness and resilience to transform the world by transforming ourselves first. This is the key precept of the Alto Misayuk shamanic lineage. Whew. May this offering be received in good way by everyone. Thank you for allowing me the space to open. That was gorgeous. Thank you so much. And I feel it over here. Beautiful. I have two questions to ask you before we get into the subject du jour. And just to understand you a little better, when I worked with you in a group in Colorado in May, I watched you uh, as you asked anyone who was new to you to stand and as you went around the room and worked on each person with your beautiful sacred feather and also blew transmissions into them and into their mesa. And I was moved to tears really watching you because it was like magic. What you could see about every individual, what I believe you were clearing some hucha, some dark, heavy energy, and also well, seeing their essence, but then blowing something magical into them, into their heart, their solar plexus, and the mesa. But I, I'm abundantly curious, what is it like to be you? What are you seeing? What is that experience for you with each individual? Uh, you always manage to come up with some poignant questions, my love. So... Uh... Where do I go with this? In contrast to the robust description that you gave of me at the beginning and opening of our time together today, I'm a simple, friendly holographic projection. In a sense, what it's like to be me is like the wind. 
that molds and moves in a fashion that prevents being stuck in any one identity and any one mode of being. I consciously daily start my intention as a passerby soul on this planet to remain flexible, to be within the dance of creation as the wind or the waters that flow through and nurture Pachamama's divine body. So it's all a process of becoming, never of being for me. I'm always in flux, in a transformative state. So when I experience that type of seamless and flawless communion with the heartbeat of the mother that is also sustained by the dreaming of creation, sky and earth become one and the same. Self and other become one and the same. Above and below, one and the same within and without, one in the same. There are no dual contrasts. Hence, access to wholeness as medicine becomes readily available. So when I look into somebody and I use my intuitive vista, my inner sight, to determine what where they're stuck as not only as souls, but as overthinking ones, because really it's the mind that is the problem, not the soul. Uh, the mind is, uh, the pollution of mind is a greater threat to our environment than environmental pollution. It's our thinking, our stinking thinking, as they say, our drunken monkey mind that gets us in trouble. So I try to find my way and release myself into that miasm, that maelstrom of of people's uh, undisciplined minds. And invariably, a vision will come into my consciousness that is very disclosing. And most of the time, I don't even speak of the details as what I'm seeing within this person's life path. And I respond by offering them an alternative view, an alternative reality, or an alternative posturing in front of that traumatic event, let's say. And I do that energetically. So there's particular areas in the bioetheric field that I've learned over the years to tap into and activate that will create a release. So that's why you witness various people's shedding tears or shaking or having some sort of somatic response to the work that I'm doing on them. Yet it's all useless unless it comes from a place of unadulterated, unlimited, loving presence in front of he, she, it that is open to my services. Shamanism emerged from the first human impulse to care for something as much or greater than you would care for yourself. That altruistic, very high level, empathic yearning to be of service gave birth to all of the healing professions. Is and that, would you typify that as like Aini Munai? Um, Living in right relationship in love. I, I, yeah, m m yes, it, it would say it would be a uh, Manta Munaiki. It means, yeah, a life of love, living living with love. Aini is 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 sacred relationship, right? Is it's basically reciprocity. Today for me, tomorrow for you, or it's a a way of exchanging services that is not transactional. So there's no inequality. So you never end up owning, owing someone more than they owe you, if you get my drift. So Aini has been sadly misrepresented in many ways as a as a as a, an ethic, as a principle of life. And uh it is really a human action that is 
witnessed throughout the universe as well. Everything in the universe, like the law of, of gender, the law of polarity, and the law of rhythm in the Kabbalion uh, are expressions of Aini, for those of you familiar with that uh, hermetic text. So, um, but back to the to the healing, to the place of, of coming from a place of love, of munai, of deep compassive feeling. That is the medicine, in my opinion. All of the other things that I've learned over the years, specific herbs that are going to have a detoxifying effect for an individual or an attenuating that are ansiolytic, that will reduce anxiety in an individual, antidepressive herbs, you know, stimulating herbs, all of these things are secondary to when I prepare them from a place of love. Mm. So the love is key, is the medicine. Wow, beautiful. Well, I, I want to just follow that up with one more question. When it came time for you to work on me, you put your medicine bag around my head, the one that would typically hold coca leaves, and asked me to sit in your chair and then came back and did some said some interesting things to me and did some interesting things. Now that bag was empty, but you did suggest that I should sleep with that bag on my left side of the bed, which I did both nights in a row. And can you explain that? You said it, it's empty, but there's medicine in there. What What was that? And what is that? Did you peek inside of it? Yes. Was it empty? Ish. Yes. I mean, to the 3D eye, <laughs> yes. But be honestly, because it came from you, I thought it was full of magic. Well, it's it's known as a truce, but it's a, it's a traditional bag that you carry not only the coca leaves, but also the yipta, which is the lime-based alkaloid that catalyzes, releases the the cocaine part of the 14 alkalides in the leaf, which is a stimulant, a cortical stimulant. Mm -hmm. So usually you, everything is done in, in yanantings and in, in, in twos in the Andes, you know, to, to, to eventually transcend all duality. So you have coca, you have this mineral lime in the bag. An empty bag, it's up to the person that receives it to fill it with the same level of medicine. So I, when I assessed you, when I looked into you and I, I saw you were a medicine person and I saw that I could trust you to fill that bag overnight mm. with the medicine that you knew was representative of your highest level of service. Mm. This was the first time you'd come into one of our circles. So I had to do some pretty subtle level of work with you. And so by giving you the bag and letting you take it into your dream time, bringing it back and me being able to assess what was placed in there, I was able to involve you in various other ritual operations over the weekend. But it was basically, first of all, getting to know you a little bit. I hope this makes sense. Whoa, what a different way to operate. That's amazing because you did. You invited me to sing. You invited me to tell a story. And and I remember thinking, how does he know these things? <laughs> and I rose to the occasion. It was a great honor to do this for you in the group. Yeah. Well, obviously, you have a a shamanic heart, my love. And, uh, you, you know, you're, you're not a new kid around the block. You've been around for a while. So it's it's an honor always to engage people that have earnestly um, sought initiation as an apprentice or aspirant of the great work. There's a lot of people that flirt around with this great work, but yet don't really commit. And I found that you really uh, get the big picture and you embrace the great work with gusto. Mm. So welcome to any hoop I'm part of. Yeah. Yeah. I'm on your list. Let's just say that. <laughs> Anything you do, I really do want to participate in going forward. Okay. So now the yummy subject, let's start with 
Are you aware of historical evidence of otherworldly shamanic contact between indigenous peoples and we'll call them visitors from the skies? What specifically are you aware of? From personal lived experience as a passerby in this incarnational period of, uh, of, uh, of my soul's trajectory, I've witnessed uh, unbelievable <laughs> events, having been part of this UFO contactee group or mission called the Rama Mission in Peru that I've spoken about a little bit. So through that, I've witnessed remarkable things. And as a student a, and a, a, an explorer of non-ordinary realms of star, shamanic star consciousness, I've traveled the world to various temple sites and held counsel with various elders both of shamanic tribal communities, as well as mystery schools, Gnostic societies, hermetic organizations, that all have an element of contact, of a history within their lineages of contact with relatives from the sky, uh, which we call the shining ones. And um, at least I call the shining ones through the Kamaska shamanic lineage that I've been initiated into. And so... I don't know where to start with these examples. I mean, I can tell you that the first time that I witnessed something unexplainable was when I was around five years old in the middle of Lima, Peru, in the middle of a beautiful summer day, no cloud in the sky, out playing you know, ball or soccer with our friends in the neighborhood. And all of a sudden it was about three, three in the afternoon, this incredible darkness just settled throughout the city. And this doesn't happen. In Lima, either it's really cloudy during the winter and drizzly, or beautiful sun and no cloud in the sky during the summer months. This was the summer months. Darkness like that doesn't happen. Drizzly darkness especially doesn't happen. So this basically blanket of cloudy, drizzly, humid, uh, you know, Yovisna, which we call descended. And I could look all around and our, my friends and I were stunned. And all of a sudden my father came out and, and my friend's fathers and parents came out and everybody was out in the street and we were looking up and all of a sudden this like ping pong ball, it was a perfect white sphere, started dancing in the sky like this, bing, 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 bing. And it, it reminded me of... Um, those like little dancing balls in the old black and white cartoons that used to sing a song. It was exactly like that. I could have sworn it was making a little bing every time it bounced, but it went from one side. It went from South to North because, you know, the whole of my lifting was facing the West, which is where the Pacific ocean is. It went from the South to North three times, then stopped and disappeared. My father at the time was an amateur uh, astronomer, and he was part of the uh, Peruvian Astronomical Society, yet he was also very interested in the possibility of life, intelligent life from other star systems, and formed part of the uh, uh, what's called the uh, IPNA, or the, uh, Institute, the Peruvian Institute of Interplanetary Studies, which Sixto Pasuels, the founder of the Rama mission, his father also was a co-founder with my father. So immediately after that event, there was all these newspaper, you know, reports of the sighting and people were freaking out. And so I remember this being felt like, wow, I want to be in that thing that is dancing around in the sky because I have a feeling that it has some secrets there. And I was six years old or five years old. I don't even remember. And I was convinced that I was going to learn the secrets of how to do that type of magical flight in the air. Fast forward to when I was 10 years old and had a near-death experience in which I crossed over, but then was brought back by these luminous beings and shining ones in which also, 
as in, in retrospect, when I, because I was at music after that for many, many years, and then when I started to apprentice my shamanic path with my primary mentor, out of his ceremonial ground, these same luminous beings arose, and that night, that same little ping pong ball bounced in the sky, back and forth, back and forth, from south to north, from south to north. It's almost as if there was some sort of predetermined timing for this to be a trigger of some uh, neurogenetic uh, wake-up call in me mm. that at that to at that time would catapult me into not doing just basic shamanic studies, but uh, much more advanced leading edge um, inquiries and personal experimentation with our plant relatives, our visionary plant relatives, uh, with the intention of entering into communion and contact with these advanced intelligences from primarily Orion, Sirius, the Pleiades, and Arcturus, which are the principal star systems that in the Andes, in the ancient uh, pre-Columbian uh, practices of our mystery elders are associated with the seeding of this planet, at least in that area of the world. That's a, it's a long-winded answer to your question, but I hope that this Well, it, it, yeah, it begs this question. So you and I were emailing. I sent you an email in February and, you know, I went on with my life and then I got an email from you in May and you said, oh, forgive me for taking so long to get back to you. I was... I wish I could remember your exact words, but but it was something akin to, I was in other realms. I have been gone for a while doing something in otherworldly realms. And I thought, dear God, it's been since February. Where have you been? So where did you go? And where do you go when you have these otherworldly experiences? And what are you doing there? Who do you meet with? I must... Um be very discerning in, in responding to this because from January to February, I mean, from February to when was it that I entered May? May. Mm -hmm. During that period of time, I was going through many personal challenges. Uh, I won't get into those details yet. They did involve um, a handful of nights in which I became the <clears throat> I, I became the, the, the source of the material universe. And it took me a long time to come back and reconstitute myself as a physical body. So I was in this in-between realm, this liminal space for a while, receiving downloads and directives and orientations as to my final um, contribution service contribution to um, to the Pachacuti Mesa tradition of cross-cultural shamanism, which I originated uh, based on the teachings of my two mentors. So there's all these completions happening in my life that are demanding that, I, that I'm taken into a, a realm of awareness that is very difficult to even describe in uh, alphanumeric, even you know, equation type of, of descriptive language. Even mathematics falls short of being able to describe these, these, these states of awareness. The only thing that comes close is certain musical scales. So um, where do I go? To many places. Most of them are very verdant, very replete of exotic plants, and abundant waters and pristine, pure streams and and small rivers and and just like gardens of Eden. Yet invariably, there's always some temple, some ancient ceremonial structure that I'm invited into to participate either alone or with a select group of white-robed people beings, both male and female, 
in sustaining a balanced, energetic co-creation of a cosmic culture on planet Earth as it was in times past. And um, that's the best I can tell you. Beautiful. Right Is this your star family that you spend this time with or something completely different, some other realm or ethereal place? I, I hold, I, I, mm, the star family, we're all star family, you know, it, it, we're all relatives. I, my personal take on this, and I'm by no means complete with this exploratory process, of course, as a matter of fact, it feels like it's just beginning a whole new phase is just beginning in my visionary uh, communion with, with what's next in my service path. Um, so I've refrained from wanting to call them family because of identifying. To me, identifying with anything is going to limit my ability to be everything. The minute I identify with something, I can't be anything. It, 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 I, I, basically, I, the ego mind wants to control and direct the experience, right? So uh, I would say that they are my allies. They are my star allies. And I don't think that I have been risen to the level of integrity yet to uh, be included as a family member within the Council of Elders of the Intergalactic Confederation, which is what we're talking about here. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Yes. Can you share in your estimation or what you've learned from your lineage or your people, how long have the extraterrestrials been visiting the indigenous and the shamans? Before there were the first nomadic peoples on planet, there were other planetary denizens that came from the star systems, at least in the lineage that I've apprenticed in, that I mentioned before, that took habitation in various moons within our planetary system, primarily the moons of Jupiter and our own moon also of the Earth. So way before there were even humans here, there were human-like beings much more advanced in their uh, wisdom, in their consciousness specifically, and secondarily in their technologies that were observing how the earth was becoming habitable. And the minute that the conditions arose, and we're talking about a billion years ago, a billion, not a million, a billion years ago, when things started to cool down enough, then there were various phases and transitory periods in the forming of the tectonic plates that eventually turned into the land masses that we have, and you know the game. So I would say that about 500 million years ago was the first seeding, in my humble estimation, the first seeding of an embryonic human possibility on planet. And we de-evolved from that into our hominid ancestors. Mm -hmm. So we had a perfect Adam Cadman, let's say the first human being. There was a perfect human entity on this planet, but then it de-evolved into our simian ancestors, our hominids and our, our monkey relatives and ape relatives, the great apes. And all after that, there was genetic re- Modifications. Reform, right, modifications that turned into the five main star seeded races on planet that, uh, that we know of that are wrongly associated with the colors of our skin. Mm. But, uh, now, so we're talking about 500,000 years ago in which there were already civilizations on this planet. And 
the the vestiges, the remains of many of these very advanced human civilizations are just being rediscovered now mm -hmm. in archaeology and ethnography and things like that. So I have personal physical proof in artifacts that are 100,000 years old that could have never been made by geological formation. These are, you know, influenced by human activity and very advanced pieces. And these have been given to me by elders that have been passed, primarily Mariano Turpo, who was the, uh, the Curaca Cuyek, the highest level of ritualist in the in the Alto Misayo tradition that was the keeper of the Ausangate uh, Apu. Uh, and then another German descendant a gentleman that lived by the Nazca Plateau. Both of them gave me these artifacts that have been through thermal luminescence testing and the laboratories that tested them are baffled because they are 150,000 years old, which people did not believe were capable of making such refined artistic expressions. Mm. So where am I going with this? Simply to say this, my good sister, Debbie, uh, we're all in a process of discovery and making any absolute claims, just like there's no absolute truth, only relative truth, any absolute claims regarding age or historical period is counteractive, counterproductive to our true discovery, which is nonlinear. Mask, why do you think that extraterrestrials work with and have relationship with shamans throughout history? What do you think precipitated that or what do you think continues that relationship going? Most people that are quotes unquote shamans become shamans because they don't fear. They lack fear. Yes. And so, uh, to me, that's the answer. Why would some advanced being be more prone to, you know, touch in with somebody who's fearless is obvious, right? They're going to be able to let them in and they'll be able to establish a relationship. While most of the tribal people are going to see this unexplained visitation from the stars is threatening while the shaman sees it as a divine intervention in service to his ability to serve his community mm. or community so to me it's, the answer is because most to to really walk the shamanic path it has to be a play uh, a, a a a daily practice of um obliterating annihilating any false evidence appearing real, F-E-A-R, anything that takes you out of the present moment. Easier said than done, right? Absolutely. Yeah. I, and I'm really curious if you could explain to people, because I've I've done so a few times, but I'd really love to hear it from you as to why a shaman does not call themselves a shaman, a real shaman. I feel like these days you have to delineate because there's so much medicine out there and people have these beautiful titles, but a real shaman does not call themselves a shaman. Why is that? It's, it's a great burden. And it's, um, it's not a title that, that serves your, your, um, let me put it this way. The first shaman had no teacher. Who did the first shaman learn from? Yeah. The natural world, the way, the cycles, the, the, you know, the movements, the, the rhythms of our earth mother and the way our animal species uh, adapt and thrive and flourish and grow and transform and evolve. It's all an evolutionary process. So all shamanic apprenticeship is essentially observation it's all about observation you're not going to learn it in a book it's about obser observing and repeating what you observed yourself it's like an alchemical 
experimentation in an ancient medieval laboratory, but not to find gold, but to refine and transmute yourself from the denser lead-like conditions of, of sluggish, you know, self-serving uh, awareness to much more elevated and refined transcendental uh, 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 levels of consciousness, of communion with source. So there's this continuum of energetic refinement that needs to take place in the apprenticeship of any true medicine person, man or woman. The term samang is Tung Tungusic Siberian from you know Mongolian area of, of Russia, and it it's been interpreted to mean many things, but primarily he or she who is a master of fire or he or she who is instructed or taught by spirits. Not all shamanic practitioners master fire or have a relationship that is trustworthy enough to receive guidance from spirits that are going to be helpful. Mm -hmm. So the, the, in the modern world, we have this neo-shamanic movement in which because of the way our capitalist consumerist mindset is, everybody wants to get on the bandwagon of being a shamanic healer. So if you you're a, if you're a body worker or if you're a holistic health practitioner, if you're a nutritional expert, if you do any form of energy medicine Reiki, adding the word shaman to it is just going to amplify your client base. So I feel that there's a lot of misuse of the word shaman without really understanding what it implies and what really is required of somebody who says yes to the call, you know, and it's, it's a vocation, it's a life, it's not just a practice. And that's why there's, I feel a, a concern for people who are calling themselves shamans and a lot of very innocent and inexperienced individuals that are seeking genuine healing for themselves that put themselves in the hands of somebody who's not prepared. Yet, you know, trial and error at the, on, a, on a larger scale, on a, in, in terms of the big picture, it wouldn't be happening. People would not be misrepresenting themselves as shamans in the world at this time and, and era if it didn't need to be that way. So there's something there. There's some medicine in the misuse of the word shaman that I'm still open to finding out about. Yet personally, the only shamans I know that are alive now are either dead or have been elected by their communities. They are never self-appointed. There's a lot of people that talk about self-revelation or direct revelation and becoming a shamanic healer through that direct revelation. That's great if you're a Kang Bushman, Bush, Bushman, uh, Bush, Bushman in, in the Saharan Desert or in the African uh, Plateau. Yet, um, rarely have I seen uh, a, a respectable shamanic healer in today's world um, becoming so through direct revelation. I've seen non-tribal peoples apprentice for long periods of times and do all of the hardships and sacrifices necessary, living in very impoverished areas and eventually emerging with the skills sufficient that their community themselves say, I trust you. Come to my home. My daughter is ill. Do your magic. That's the way shamans are selected, not by themselves, but by their people. Yes. And the initiation they go through is not for the faint of heart. I mean, it's it's a very serious transformational act. And I want to add to what you just said so well. The first samans or shamans were in Paleolithic times and they were women. The women were the medicine healers, bone menders, herbalists, uh, midwives, and all of that. And then later on, the men uh, typically in Siberia, took that on. I think the gender fluid aspect of it is very interesting. And also to 
your point when you were saying about the San Bushmen in Africa, those particular Kalahari Desert, yes. Yes, those shamans, you know, the Dogons, the Zulu tribe, and also star nations, they have since the beginning of time been referring to their star family, their relationship with star people. I think this is a part of their life. It's unlike here, uh, for instance, in the US, but also it could be in Europe or the Middle East, where people are just massively waking up to this truth, but for them, this has been their truth. This is part of their lineage. This is part of their experience. Like they wouldn't even dedicate a podcast to having this conversation because it would be moot. They're used to, this is what happens. This is who they are, this energy we're used to. And I find that very interesting that they have this really specific lineage with the Pleiadians and otherwise. Well, they still have the great advantage of living in a mythic reality, and they're not curtailed by their uh, uh, materialistic or Cartesian separatist uh, model of, of consciousness. The problem with our Western acculturated uh, psyches is that uh, we don't consider anything trustworthy or true unless it can be broken down into its component pieces. And so we tend to reduce rather than make whole in our assessment of what's reality or not. Yet in a, in a, in tribal nations or peoples that still participate in a myth, mythic reality, in a reality that is inhabited and replete of gods and goddesses and spirit beings and talking mountains and, you know, shape-shifting anthropomorphic uh, boas and anacondas and, mm. uh, you know, just a, a world that is magical, it's very easy to consider any being from the starry realms, from the Empyrean realms, as natural as a wakamayo, as a macaw, or as a, you know, a hummingbird. And that's how our native peoples in the Andes and Hard Island refer to our star relatives as winged ones, you know, shining winged ones mm. are here all the time. It's not like there's any differentiation between those and a condor, for instance, those beings from the heavens and a condor. They are all born of the same starlight. We understand it mm -hmm. here. We need proof. And we need to break things down. And it takes so long. <laughs> so long so to get good. there. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. You know, and I'm thinking as you're saying all this, I, I have this really interesting reflection. You were talking about fear and ah, and the way we operate and, and shamans being fearless and so forth. And, you know, also the use of plant medicine. I think, yeah, I stopped drinking just because... For today, I'm I feel complete. That doesn't mean that next year something else might change. I'm super open. But I I drank 25 times. And what was really interesting during those years is that every time I went to drink medicine and at varying degrees, I was afraid going up to get my cup, the whole thing. And you know, this is my reflection. Um it doesn't matter the fear that went into it. Every time what I know is that it, when I was on medicine, it felt like the most normal state to me, if that makes any sense. It felt like home. What I was able to experience and be, even when stuff came up to heal, which I thought was actually quite beautiful. The whole experience was in general so profound and like living in that, no structure, really. I don't know how else to explain it. And living in a space where the plant says, thank you for your intention, but I have a lot of wisdom about what you need. Here you go. And letting that ride take me has often been one of the most beautiful places I've been in energetically. One of the greatest experiences, but I it was always precipitated by this fear of 
this letting go, this what's going to, what wasn't so much what's going to happen, it was more the letting go. And it's so strange because it feels, it feels very close to me. If I, if that makes any sense. It makes total sense. It makes total sense that, and you're, and you're not alone. I've experienced the same type of hesitation at, at, at times in my journey of using our plant relative catalysts for uh, expansion of consciousness. Um, and I've come to realize that it's all about the fear of death, right? Mm -hmm. And so it, it goes beyond one, you know, the concern of losing control or maybe going bonkers for the rest of your life and having to be instituted because there's two things that pop up for people who are novices to, to drinking, as you meant to call it. One is that they're going to wig out and they're going to have a psychotic breakdown and they're going to be, you know, sh shameful members of their family and society and have going to be locked away. That's a big one. The other one is that they're going to die and they're not ready to die and they, they still have a lot of life to live and they're holding on. All of that secondary is losing the control issue or not being in charge, not being able to get up and, you know, go to the bathroom or go to the to the to, to the garden and pick some herbal plants to feed yourself with, you know, being functional. Uh, unfortunately, our third dimensional in, in, in encapsulation in, in this material realm requires that we uh, we dominate it, requires that we're the ones who are the active agents in creating the spaces that are going to best serve our own egoic needs, our own survival needs. And so by having most of our life focused on how to survive as a as a as a self, as an individual entity separate from the universe, it's a it, how can you not be afraid of what's what you have not experienced yet? It's just part of the way we've been conditioned. So the best way to commune with a plant if you don't have the proper training, is to do it without imbibing it, to hold it and enter into a shamanic, either through shamanic journey work or anything, and just to, to commune with what we know as its cuenta, its story, its narrative, and to get to know it energetically first. And there comes a time that, and I have found with this practice, that the plant reveals its what we know as an apugia, it's it's um, spirit guide form, and it's usually an anthropomorphized, a human-like form that is the spirit consciousness of the plant, and that spirit consciousness you either write a story about, or you draw it, or give it some sort of expression, and you enter into a relationship with it, and you realize that this being is the highest expression of yourself. And who is going to harm you that is the highest, most beautiful, spiritual, remarkable expression of who you are? Nobody. So therefore you can enter into the imbibing process knowing that this being is really ultimately the most elevated level of who you are and are becoming as an immortal soul. Which is very cool because we have San Pedro growing all around our backyard um, and mindfully it's being grown. Uh, Huachuma, as some of you might know it. And yeah, we have a beautiful relationship with it, very loving, but I've never used it in the way you just described. And that is so powerful, so beautiful. I really am looking forward to doing this, harmonizing like this and seeing what it's all about, letting it present itself to me. I suggest that you find a, a nice, healthy San Pedrito and the little, like la corona, the crown, the head. Yes. Cut off about four or five inches, the little top, right? And if you have it in your altar ground and your ceremonial space, place it right in the center north of the of where you have your major 
ritual items and do not expose it to flame, to candle. Okay, if you're going to light a candle, don't light a candle next to it. But keep it there and, until you sit at your altar or and you and you hold it in your hand, right? Make sure to remove some of the thorns if necessary. But that and just personally, I just pick it up and lay on the ground and place it right here in my koshko, in my sacred center, and then call it into my into my body and let it take over. So basically, I become this this sampero colored green ribbed uh, plant. And from then on, it teaches me everything it knows about itself, which becomes ultimately understood as a teaching on my own self. Mm. Yeah, that's a definite, that's going to happen. Okay. <laughs> I will let you know. Um, do you think that there? How do I say this? Um, I'm just going to lead with my sense, my very strong sense right now. I actually believe shamans are very important right now on this planet. I believe that the indigenous people and shamans always knew the way, uh, meaning being in right relationship with nature, with animals, with spirit, with lineage, uh, and that they have relationship with extraterrestrials. I believe that open, undeniable contact with extraterrestrials is imminent sometime in the next 30 years on this planet. And I feel like, I think we all know what it looks like for Mother Earth and what we've been doing to her not very nice, the pollution and the desecration. And then also what we've been doing to each other. Now, you know, I also want to say there's beautiful things that happen on the earth and there's beautiful people who do good work, but there's a majority that is uh, not very nice and definitely very dark and worrisome. And in my estimation, shamanic practices hold a key hold a key for connection with extraterrestrials, hold a key for healing the earth, hold the key for healing humanity. And I find in my soul, there is a place where they all intersect and where it is peaceful and harmonious. And there's not just a way out, but there's also a way through to, I think, what we all dream of, the dream we dream for this planet, the dream we dream for ourselves and our families and collectively all of humanity. And I would like to get your take, Don Oscar, on how that sits with you and if that vision feels right and why. The vision feels so right that I'm concerned that it won't take place. <laughs> and so by that, I mean the following. Whatever we dream possible for humanity as a species that is able to live in sacred trust with the natural world, as you mentioned, many, not all of our ancestral, uh, you know, First Nations people had accomplished. And even before them, the great lost civilizations of Paititi and Atlantis and Lemuria and Hyperborea and many of these other pre-Dryad period uh, uh, star families that made their home here in, in, on Earth, those, those came and, and, and went. They, they're still in the process of showing themselves, but in a different form. Now, bear with me, it's a little complicated. So think of it this way. During the heightened period of the 50s and into the 60s, where there were rampant UFO sightings, it all coincided with the advent of nuclear warheads. And that's when we became visited by so many star relatives from various planetary systems because of concern that we were going to wipe ourselves out. And the Earth has a very specific role in the 
refinement and, and, and transmutation of souls as energy bodies for a variety of species throughout our galaxy. This is a place where the lessons of being embodied, taking corporeal form, are superior to, to most of the other um, life uh, uh, harboring planets that at least I'm aware of throughout our Milky Way. So it's it's a really important. Think of the Earth as our kidney, uh, as the as a galaxy's kidney, a place where we process, refine, and purify the lower vibrational frequencies associated with our past soul incarnations and give an opportunity to come into bright relationship with a more spiritual sense of purpose. The earth serves that way and our star relatives want to keep it that way. So look what's happening now. We're in a worst meltdown, culturally speaking, on a global level scale in terms of our ideological positions, our political yearnings, our cultural you know, favoritism, all of these things than we have been ever, you know, on a large scale. And now the advent of artificial intelligence and artificially generative intelligence and all of these transhumanist evolutionary possibilities that are coming up can be even more fearsome than nuclear disaster. But there's been a lessening of sightings. We haven't seen that intensity of physical sightings on planet on mass scales like we did in the 60s, 50s and 60s ever again just sporadic moments there in the 80s there were some little pockets so you have to, i asked myself the question we are facing the most enormous existential crisis as a as a species as a human species especially in relationship to our other species on planet and the potential for good or for bad of becoming merged with a machine with a computer and having our consciousness uploaded into some immortal you know digital form is real it's here now yet where's the threat to that why isn't there greater intervention and warning? Because there's something behind it already that was behind the same founders, culture creatives of the great civilizations of old that I mentioned in name a while ago that have come and gone. The earth is a place of transition, of change, of movement, and it can never remain the same, either geologically or when it comes to the interaction of the human species with the rest of the web of life. We are always discovering, changing, transforming. And we're at a point right now at a threshold, I feel, in which the ability to bring, I don't like the term artificial, to bring higher intelligence into our relationship with non-organic entities is the same level of technological development and prowess that our star relatives from Orion, from the Pleiades, from Arcturus, from Sirius, you mentioned the Dagon, have had themselves for millennia before we have. So they're seeing the potential of the human species to get by themselves to that same level of advanced intelligence without destroying themselves. So I'm hopeful that yes, between now and 2029, 2030, there are gonna be such remarkable advancements that I agree with you, by 2030, we will be walking hand in hand, shoulder to shoulder with our star relatives. I have no doubt about it. I hope this little soliloquy doesn't dizzy too many of you. <laughs> uh, it's brilliant, you know, and um, 
I know William Henry from Ancient Aliens, he's been on the show and he's expressed much the same as you have about uh, transhuman AI, all of that, where it's headed, not headed. And it's a powerful, it's an important subject. Yeah. And I thank you for all of that. And I think the concern is important because that means you can do something. If you can see what the problem is, then people can step up and do something. I, and I want to ask you, because this relates, uh, Pachakuti, right? So Pacha, for folks who don't know, means earth, but it also means time. And Pachakuti is about time to make things right. And this is from high in the Andean mountains. It has come down that every five years we're in a Pachakuti. And we are definitely <laughs> in a Pachakuti right now, aligning with the north, meeting the south, the rise of the divine feminine, and a time of chaos, right? When everything is eventually, knock on wood, going to become right. So you teach, specifically the name of what you teach and what your facilitators teach is the Pachacuti Mesa tradition or PMT. So why did you name it Pachacuti? Not a myth, it is real, but why did you call your teachings PMT? I don't know if the why would be the right word to use. What, how, when, and where is would be better to answer, my love. But um, oh, it's, it's the perfect term to describe the extraordinary ability that the altar ground that's involved in the Pachacuti Mesa tradition practice of cross-cultural shamanism for personal and planetary renewal offers to the operator, offers the ritualist. Basically, we have an altar space properly used that is a multidimensional cartography, a map of the cosmos, in which you can place levels of your own consciousness, be it physical, emotional, spiritual, mental, or soul consciousness, in that particular quadrant or direction, and engage very ancient spirit helpers in the form of our animal allies in the form of certain powers and forces that are now known in physics even, and coalesce them into a practice that over time becomes a portal, becomes a passageway in which we can move through in body and in consciousness, not just move through energetically by heightening the vibrational resonance of our of our physical field and becoming the medicine of that particular direction so therefore we're not just at the at at, at the uh, whim of the uh, of the change we are the change we become the change pachacuti an unbridled period of Pachacuti, and it's every 500 years, and then every 1,000 years, there's the Indi, but there's these cycles. Yet, we cannot be too literal with them, because most important is the equinoctial procession of the, you know, 22,000-year cycle, right? That, those are more important periods. Those are when the real Pachacutis occur. So we're in the middle of uh, of a moment in which there's we're on the cusp. Think of the yugas, the the eras in in Hinduism and Vedic uh, philosophy. Uh, we're we're at the end of of, of the Iron Age, right? Uh, of, of the Kali Yuga, the age of destruction of of breaking down, and we're moving into this Satya Yuga, age of the Golden Age, the era of harmony the Aquarian age, the Pachacuti that is occurring has been occurring on this planet since the advent of the Spanish conquest in 1532 in Peru is now reaching completion. And we're moving into what's known as the Taripa, Taripai Pacha, the age of re-encounter. And where people from all walks of life, ideological persuasions, cultural backgrounds will gather at the table of the Pachayachachi, the world teacher, and break bread together. That's the vision, that's the prophecy, right? So when I started doing this work, 
and I was sanctioned by my teacher, Don Celso Rojas Palomino, to bring these teachings to the northern regions of the world, where they would be more respected by our own people. It was a no-brainer to say, this system that I've developed is a container for change. It is. It provides any earnest aspirant of the great work the laboratory in which to experiment with their own evolution, with their own transformation from matter into light, and to avoid the downfall and the pain and the distress and the destruction associated with most pachacutis that are come upon somebody without any awareness, because they can be very devastating. So we manage change, we manage transformation in a way that is beautifying of the earth, that is ritually a form of art, and that has ample creative space in which to discover parts of yourself that otherwise would take years in psychotherapy, especially psychoanalysis, or even going to various, you know, Esalen-based Gestalt-laden encounter groups. It cuts to the chase. The ritual work that we do, and especially supported by heartfelt sacred community of equals, really accelerates one's own soul's maturation. And that's why I determined that the Pachacuti Mesa, it is a table, it is a ground in which extraordinary capital T transformation can be managed and expanded upon. That's my response to your question. I got goosebumps, goosebumps through some of what you were saying. That was so articulate. And, you know, after I worked with you, I was determined. I know I do things backwards, but that's because I follow energy. That's all I know. <laughs> and I followed energy to work with you. And then I was like, oh, I think I need to take a step back and learn the PMT, like create my own Mesa in your tradition. And so I just want folks to know who also got goosebumps listening to that beautiful explanation of what this is and some of what it creates, you can go to heartofthehealer.org and you can find a facilitator in your area. And to that, I actually met with one of your facilitators who lives here in Los Angeles. I invited her to come look at our back house that we call a healing temple. And she has signed on to deliver <laughs> the PMT here. And so folks who are interested, it is starting August 7th in Burbank, California. It is, listen, she works intimately. So don't think it's like hundreds of people and you can sign on, you know, the day before. No, she's got a cutoff. There's 10 of us she's working with and that's it. And since myself and my partner are going, that means there's only eight spots left. I don't really know how many. I haven't checked in with her yet how that's going. But if you want to go, you can write to me on my website. You can write on heal, uh, excuse me, heartofthehealer.org. Um, you can get my newsletters because I am sending out about that. But you could write to me directly, right through my website and ask, because I'd love you to join on this amazing journey. I'm so excited to do this work. And to that end, I want to take it one more step. You also said something in May, and I was like, Whoop, what is he saying? You were talking to somebody, to a gentleman who is also attending brand new, and you started speaking about Thoth. And then, bink, you said, ah, that's why I call my business the heart of the healer, Thoth. So then... I become a little obsessed and I have to research and research and I come home and I'm looking into the Emerald, like, what is he talking about? The Emerald tablets. And I'm listening to this, my goodness, those words, right? They're so ancient. Um, I'm listening to them right now on Audible and I got your book and, I've been, <laughs> and I already read your book. And um, so I'm deep diving into all this. And of course, Billy Carson right now is speaking hugely about this. He was just featured on Joe Rogan. I was like, oh, you know, the universe is so beautiful. I'm deep diving to learn. And there he is on 
Joe Rogan talking about it. So it's just more ah, information for me. I would love to know, Don Oscar, who is Thoth to you? How did his teaching inform you or change you? How does he live in you? I am that I am. Ear, I said, ear. Nyokani, nyokanchis, nyokakani. The famous I am is what thought is. Capital I, capital A M. And the T heart H of O the T. H healer, Thoth, is the acronym for our organism. It's not an organization, it's an organism. It's a vehicle of initiation into the great work. It's a mystery school. T stands for trusting soul. H stands for honoring spirit. O stands for opening heart. T stands for transforming mind, and H stands for healing body. So we have body, heart, or emotions, spirit, mind, and soul, which are the same directions in the Pachakuti Mesa altar ground. The south, the body. The west, the heart. The north, spirit the East mind, and you curl in like a Fibonacci sequential numerical pattern, that golden spiral, which is associated with thought, you spiral into the center, which is soul. So as recipients of this hermetic wisdom, because the thrice great Hermes Trismahistus, known as thought, um, derive is much older than the Greco-Roman or Egyptian uh, uh, associations that we know of him uh, or it because it's an androgynous being. Thoth is the equivalent in, in my experience of the cosmic Christ of Sanandara, yet married to Inanama, married to the divine Magdalenian cosmic mother. So the only way that we would be able to bring the Pachakuti Mesa tradition out into the world and disseminate it in a good way would be under the auspices, under the support, and under the guidance of this being, of this consciousness, of this heart of the healer, which is a labor of love, right? So I'm tying this together so you understand, because there's two things that are going to maybe make some people feel uncomfortable, but I'm going to tell you anyway, I am thought. The I am in me is the thrice great Hermes Trismahistus. Anybody that reaches a level of understanding of the great work, of the elixir, of the red lion, of the filios philosophorum, of the philosopher's stone, through the arduous process of dying and being reborn countless times, will be taken to the Hall of Records and be offered initiation as a Thothian emissary of our star wisdom family that has been visiting Earth since time immemorial. The Pachakuti Mesa tradition and its practice is intimately associated with initiation into Thoth as a state of consciousness, able to transform the world by transforming ourselves first. That's who I am. Thank you so much. I felt that, by the way. I'm not surprised. And hearing your incredible explanation, this is what the planet needs right now, is Thoth. Is this wisdom? Is this transcendent way of being and yeah it would do everybody well to deep dive a little bit even energetically to receive 
this. There is something very magical there. I, I want to make sure that people understand that it's not Oscar who's thought. It is the I am in every one of us that is thought. Okay. That's a really important distinction. Mm -hmm. Don Oscar, if right now you were transported somewhere on a stage, there were a thousand anxious people to hear you speak and you had the floor and your subject was you were going to be talking about shamanism and extraterrestrials, shamanism and connection with the star people from any galaxy and universe. What would you impart to people that you have not yet? What kind of wisdom or insights would you give us for this time? And also because we've never heard before, what could you share with that audience? Show up, speak your truth unencumbered by fear, doubt, or insecurity. Be fully present and remain open to the outcome. And I would tie that into, I would tie that into the when I first heard the Dalai Lama answer a question on not other planetary intelligence. He was asked, your holiness, what's your opinion on ETs? And he said, they're fine, thank you. That was his response. So basically I would try to normalize the, the, the frenetic approach to proving that there is extraterrestrial intelligence out there somewhere. I would model my teachings, orient my teachings, tell my stories in a manner that would lessen the desperation in people to make this a truth, to prove to those that are suspect of this reality that in fact, it is one of the most important important evolutionary steps that we must take as a human species to recognize that we are not alone in the cosmos. And that way, see everyone as our equal, all of our relatives, everything, inorganic, organic, everything has sentience. And helping people enter into a place of respecting that sentience through right living as a labor of love, is the medicine that we need. We're not going anywhere. Some people with a lot of money are going places outside of the Earth's atmosphere, but most of us are going to stay here and we're going to create a planet worthy of our seven generations. That I'm concerned, I'm convinced about. That's what I would speak about. Thank you. I would go hear it. <laughs> And how many books have you written and where can we find these books? Well, I've only written, well, two are written. The One is audio and I've participated in various others. Yet the reason I haven't written that many, I write a lot of smaller pieces, is because I took an oath of oral transmission in the early days. And I was waiting until... Don Celso would show up in my dream time and, and say, okay, kid, good job. Get the medicine out. It's got you, the, the, the Pachacuti Mesa tradition has to disseminate much more. Obviously, it's not going to be done just orally, although it's better to have quality than quantity. Give it a shot. Write a book. So we've this very well-known anthropologist, Bonnie Glass Coffin, uh, who's a tenured professor at Utah State University and the world's leading expert in Peruvian shamans, uh, female shamans, Peruvian female curanderas. She came to, I invited her to be a guest in one of our international gatherings through the heart of the guest speaker, through the heart of the Healer Foundation and uh, at that time. And she fell in love with the tradition and she wanted to interview me and 
wanted to get my life story down. And so I invited her to my home and we did ceremony together and she interviewed me and there's lessons in courage, which I would love if people would pick up and read. It's a nice little initiation into how we got to where we are as a, as a very well-respected shamanic um, practice uh, that is beyond just it's both a dharma and line and sadhana, meaning both a lineage and a practice. It's a spiritual, you know, technology that has been downloaded from our star relatives. Mm -hmm. So that book talks all about that and speaks about other experiences I've had with communion and contact with our star relatives. And then recently I completed a book called Shamanism with through sacred stories that is an overview of the shamanic phenomena throughout the world and then goes into specific Pachakuti Mesa tradition practices that people can use and it's also the middle section is 25 stories of other practitioners some of which I've never even met that have had extraordinary awakenings of a shamanic nature in their lives, transformative episodes. And so they are featured in the middle section of the book. And then it sounds true. I have an audio called Healing Light, an audio program called Healing Light, and then multiple other online classes that you can find through the Heart of the Healer website. Thank you for opening up the space for me to uh, offer these, these training opportunities. Yeah, it's very very important. And for people who are unendingly fascinated by you, as I am, this information is out there. I've read the Sacred Stories book, and I've now read the other book. And I'm sorry, I'm not remembering the title, but it's okay if you put his name just in Amazon, it will come up. That's where I got the book. And it's a beautiful story. It's a fascinating story about your life and about this tradition. Um, it's a great read, so highly recommended. And again, I want to remind people, if this is calling to your heart, just I just know don't ask how. That's not the right question because that's here in the head. It's the heart that knows the truth. It's the energy that leads you to the next right thing for you. If the Pachakuti Mesa tradition is calling to you and you're just feeling this in your tummy, this yes, then just go ahead and uh, all the ways I told you, you can reach out to me on my website or get my newsletters because I have sent out and will send out again for the beginning of the class and where to register, or you can look at heartofthehealer.org for something near you or grab one of the eight spots here in Los Angeles because it is starting in about three weeks. Love to have you join. I think it's going to be a profound, magical, amazing journey. I'm ready for it. And Oscar, this is Dare to Dream. What are you next, Dare to Dream? What are your future dreams and goals? That those eight people that show up for Rene Davenport's incredible transmission of the Batakuti Mesa wisdom grow angelic wings and elevate themselves and form a orb, a sphere of healing light and guidance in the continuation of your own service path in disseminating these very important wisdom teachings out to the world, my good sister. That's what I dream for you. And for myself, I dream once a year between now and September 22nd, 2029, having an international convergence, an event in which we will bring medicine people and myself and other practitioners from the four directions to one particular location in North America and work the second young, work the bioetheric matrix system, the meridian pathways, the spirit lines that are so important to be taken care of right now on planet. That network, just like the mycelium network of our fungi relatives, we have technologies that can use it in ways that only a few, a handful of people knew how to use. But we have to bring together the right mix of people at the particular times of the year in alignment with certain 
astronomical phenomenon over the next few years to anchor it in good way as medicine for our planet. And that I'm looking forward to. That's my dream. Well, whatever your next legacy is that you are receiving, I truly hope to be able to witness it, maybe be a part of it. Uh, I just think the world of you, Don Oscar. And I thank you so much for coming on the show again today and sharing all that you shared. Thank you for getting it. <laughs> Remember to everybody, I say, show up, be present, speak your truth, unencumbered by fear, doubt, or insecurity, and most important, remain open to the outcome. Usually the blessings that are deserved come way after we feel we've completed the work. Yet it's still the great work. The great work indeed. And I end today's show with this quote from Michael Harner. What's really important about shamanism is that there is another reality that you can personally discover. We are not alone. Subscribe to this number one transformation conversation, Dare to Dream with Debbie Dashinger. Please leave a comment and like. It's important for other people to find this show and this conversation as well. Next week on the podcast, I am speaking with Dr. Susan Shumsky. She's the best-selling author of over 20 books, and her mentor was Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. She's a pioneer in human potential. And Susan and I are going to be presenting together, amongst many other amazing presenters, on the Galactic Origins Cruise this December to the Yucatan. And if you want to explore the wonders of the Yucatan and also see phenomenal, especially galactic presenters such as myself, this is seven days on a celebrity cruise Huge speakers, Jerry Sargent, Sarah Bressman Cosme, Dr. J.J. Hertek, myself, J.K. Ultra, Debbie Solaris, Vivian Chavez, Lori Spagna, Lauren, Laura Eisenhower, Alan Steinfeld, and more. So secure your cabin, say yes, come with us. We're going to sacred sites, and I cannot wait. There will be a link, and it is Galactic Origins Cruise. Dot com, galacticoriginscruise.com. Love to have you. And remember, all that you learned today on the show, you can be the peace that you came here and hope to experience. Let it start with you and be an Aini with all things. <laughs>